some of the skills that he talked about we're going to be building on today, and then we'll be building them on uh, next class and then on throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, so as always, um, I will um, start by telling you what we're going to do. As, as soon as Samantha's back, she'll take attendance um, silently. Um, so we'll do housekeeping, practice tip of the day. We will do um, some discussion about your upcoming meetings. We're going to meet with uh, each of you in pairs individually. It will be a client uh, attorney simulation uh, to discuss uh, your progress on the second memo of the semester, the Brady memo. Um, we will talk briefly about the homework that you turned in on Friday, uh, that you, your research where you had to go to the library and use those resources. Uh, we will maybe discuss the Blue Book today, we probably will. We'll dip our toe in the water um, to discuss how to cite federal statutes. Uh, we will do, um, talk about research. Uh, thanks, thank you very much. And uh, we will uh, practice research. And then if time, we will do a guard game. Um, so uh, Bailey, can you grab the door? Thanks very much. Chris. Yep. Um, since we have 21 people, I think, me, and me, Zach, and Michaela wanted to see if we can meet with you again. Okay. Yes, the odd numbers uh, is always a challenge. Some years um, it's an extra challenge because people really like to work in, uh, in groups. Um, but um, no, there's no problem. Okay, thanks. Okay, so housekeeping first. I'm not finished grading. Uh, what I have graded so far, you should be happy to know. Pretty good, it's pretty good. Um, so as I emailed, you will have a conference with me on either October 15th, October 16th, or October 17th. Um, here's what you should do to prepare for that conference. You should be researching the memo assignment about the Brady question. Does anyone know what movie the characters in the Brady question Devastating, devastating. Beverly Hills Cop, greatest movie ever made. Not the greatest movie ever made. One of the greatest movies ever made. One of the greatest 80s movies ever made. Uh, so October 15th, 16th, 17th, we'll have a meeting. Email me by 11.59 the night before. Email me the outline for your memo. The way the timing will work here is the 17th is a Wednesday. You'll have your outline to me on the 17th or before if you meet on Monday or Tuesday. Then you'll get feedback on that after the client simulation where you talk about the research progress you've done, how you're planning to structure your memo. Then you'll have a week to turn that around into a draft. Your draft will be due on Wednesday, October 24th. And then um, you'll have two weeks after that to do your final draft. I'm also going to email, this is more housekeeping stuff, I'm going to email you two kinds of evaluations. Number one, I'm going to email you a mid-semester evaluation of me. Uh, because as much as I value, and I do truly value, the end of the semester evaluations of me, I also want to know if there's things I can do right now to make the class better and to make learning better. So those emails will be emailed to you later today. Uh, please fill them out and bring them back anonymously um, on Friday. And the second evaluation you're going to do is an evaluation of each other. Um, and the way this works is you'll do an evaluation for each one of your Garner game groups that you've been collaborating with all semester, each one of your Garner group members. And uh, it just asks uh, a simple question, yeah, two simple questions. One is, uh, tell me something that they do well as a partner, as a collaborator. And then, um, is, there any, is there anything that they could improve um, that you can suggest in a, in a polite and constructive way? Um, so I do this every year, and uh, I have found that it, it, um, the most important thing it does is it lets you know how much your group members value the work you're doing. Um, OK, the reading for next class is Reed Garner, section two, and section seven. And then read the blue book, 18 and 19. 
That's all the housekeeping. Any questions? Okay, uh, the practice tip of the day is to, when you're at work, have a ready answer to small talk questions. So this may seem like an insignificant thing, but part of succeeding at work and being promoted, but also um, you know, getting, building mentorships, and just enjoying your life at work is kind of building <clears throat> the social capital with the people you work with. And so, you know, you'll often get asked just like basic small talk questions, like what's new? Or what'd you do this weekend? Actually, Samantha asked me what I did this weekend when uh, we were planning for the class today. And I didn't have a ready-made answer. I had to check my calendar because I'm like that guy in 12 Angry Men. Have you ever seen that movie? And they say, what movie did you see last night? And you can't remember the movie you saw last night, which is an alibi for the murder. That's going to be me, okay? Because I'm like losing my mind by the day. But um, I checked my calendar. Turned out to be one or two fun things this weekend. Um, how's your kid? Do you have a kid? I get asked that all the time. And sometimes I just have like a boring answer. But sometimes I like have a little story. Like did I tell you the story about that? She asked about, um, uh, she said, I'm going to miss you when you go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I told you so. Um, yeah. So, um, so have answers ready for these small talk questions. Um, they will make your work life a little more fun, but they'll also make you, um, you know, easier to, to kind of build rapport with your coworkers. And then also have ready answers, not just to small talk questions, but to loaded questions. And here's one of the ultimate loaded questions at a law firm. What are you working on? Seems totally harmless, but you can give two extreme answers to this that can be uh, detrimental to your career prospects. Okay? One answer is, um, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, it's so hard. I'm like barely, I'm barely surviving here. And then like, you know, there's a time to like let your supervisor, especially your supervisor, know that like you, you have too much on your plate and you need some help. There's a time to do that in a in kind of a thoughtful, intentional way. But you don't want to be the person who every day is like complaining and whining about your job. And nobody wants, nobody like, no, no supervisor wants to work with that person. But you can go to the other extreme too. Oh, what are you working on? Oh, not much. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't have that much on my plate. Well, then if the supervisor is like, oh my gosh, well, guess what? I've got a lot of work I'm going to give you. And if you were swamped already, and you were just kind of trying to play it cool, um, then now the supervisor can be like, oh, well, here, here's a bunch more work, and now you have too much work to do. So what I try to do is keep a list of everything that I was working on so that if a supervisor calls and says, hey, I've got a new project. I'm looking around for someone to do it. I, I, don't want to, you know, I don't want you to have to do it if you don't have the time to do it. Um, what are you working on? I didn't have to, like, whine but I also could remember everything that I was working on. And so then I just like stated, like Joe Friday, like just the facts, ma'am, here's what I'm working on. And then usually it was enough <laughs> that if I didn't want more work, um, they, they understood. Um, so practice tip of the day, have a ready answer to questions that you can expect. Don't, unless, unless your like, mind works a lot sharper than mine, which is highly possible, um, prepare ahead of time. Don't depend on yourself to come up with it on the, on the fly. Okay, let's talk about your meetings for the week of October 15th. Um, you'll come in, you don't have to come in in character, but then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you like, okay, we're gonna begin the simulation. And then what you should imagine is that I am a somewhat sophisticated client. And by the way, when you're a junior attorney, we talked about this before, your supervisor is kind of a client. Think of your partner as a client. And so you should respond to questions the way you would respond to a question, which will respond to a client or a partner once we begin. And there's a skill to being able to talk to a client or a supervisor about the law. So when you're asked a question directly, Priya, we've talked about this a little bit. You're asked a question directly, what, let's say you're asked a yes or no question. What should one of the first words out of your mouth? Yeah, if your supervisor asks you a yes or no question. Probably. <laughs> we have talked about you don't want to um, guarantee victory or guarantee defeat on a case. So if the, if the supervisor says, hey, do you think we have a good, uh, winning claim here? You don't want to say definitely, absolutely, yes, there's no way we will lose. Uh, unless that's the case. You know, often not going to be the case. Um, but even if probably is the first word out of your mouth, one of the second or third words should be yes or no. If you're asked a yes or no question, respond with a yes or no answer. You can expand from that. Um, 
But, um, you know, I had a boss who, one of the things that drove him craziest was if he asked, if he asked one of us a question and we talked for three minutes without ever, ever having answered the question. Um, and he was like a very nice guy in general, but he had very little patience for that. Um, so uh, when you're asked a question, answer the question directly, begin with a yes or no, and then give an explanation. Um, don't have a big, long wind up. You can go into detail, but do, go into detail after you've given the kind of executive summary. Um, and avoid BS. It was the first practice tip of the day. You're going to break my heart if you don't remember the very first practice tip of the day of this lecture. Yes, yes. I don't know, but I'll find out. Oh, it's great. And, so. and that would have been a good answer to my question <laughs> if you didn't know what the first practice tip of the day was. Okay, so uh, well done, Shelby. Well done, Shelby. Um, so if someone asks you a question, a supervisor asks you a question, you don't know the answer, the correct answer is, I don't know, but I'll find out. Don't BS. Don't BS. And so in this meeting with the client, the simulation, if you don't know, say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Avoid BS. Um, I also had a boss, different boss, who um, just was not into the details. And so you have to know your audience when you're writing, but you also have to know your audience when you're communicating verbally. And so if he asked a yes or no, if he asked a question, well, even if it wasn't a yes or no question, I needed to make sure that the first sentence or two of my answer communicated the most important thing. Because there was an excellent chance that he was going to stop paying attention after that first or second sentence. So if I wanted to go into lots of detail and tell him about the 13th footnote and the 57th case that is mildly relevant but not a controlling authority, okay, that can, I can do that. But that is, there's no way that that can be my first, second, and third question. All right? Um, so know your audience, but um, as a general matter, get to the point. Okay, so what should your outline have? What should your outline have? Alex, no way that you sh should uh, know this answer perfectly because we haven't discussed uh, <coughs> outlining yet. Part of your reading for next class is going to be how Brian Garner suggests uh, outlining and going about a writing project beginning with the research and the brainstorming and then the outlining. Um, but I say, bring me an outline for your memo on October 15th, 16th, or 17th. What are some, one or two things that you think might be a good thing to have in that outline? Like the issue presented or like a deep issue? Perfect, perfect. Yes, say, say the second thing again. Deep issue. Yes, so a deep issue statement, which has two parts. What are the two parts of a deep issue statement, Alex? Uh, question presented. Yep. And uh, uh, short answer. And short answer. Okay. In the range of 50 words, 50, 75 words, question presented, short answer. Um, then for your outline, I would like a fact section, but not like a full sentences, paragraphs. I want you to do a facts outline. By outline, for this I mean bullet points. Uh, now, what facts do we include in a fact section, Alex? Relevant legal facts. <laughs> yes, yeah. legally relevant facts. And we've talked before, remind us, what is a good test for whether or not a fact is legally relevant and should be included in your fact section? Um, if it's something that would change the dynamics of that. Yes, yes, and in order to find that out, imagine you've already written your discussion section. Well, can, how can you use your discussion section to inform your fact section? Mm -hmm. And you can phone a friend if you yeah, want. Yeah, I think I might. Anybody remember this? Yes. Make Bailey. sure that everything that's in your um, conclude or the back section is also in like your analysis and what you're talking about. Uh, kind of, but more more the reverse. So you're you're on to it. But once you get to your discussion section, discussion section will have rule explanation and rule application. Rule explanation, you explain the legal rule and the abstract, and then rule application, you apply it to our facts. When you write this discussion section, which is the heart of the memo, and you do your rule application, you're going to be connecting precedence and text to the facts of our case. So one thing you can do is once you've written your discussion section, you can circle every fact from our case that you mentioned in your discussion section. And then make sure that every fact you circled is described in the facts section. And also think, and maybe this was what Bailey was getting at a little bit, if you've got a lot of facts in this fact section, 
that weren't circled in your discussion section, that could be a red flag. That could be a red flag. It's not to say that you can't have a fact or two that provides some context and, and kind of helps uh, orient the reader to the narrative. But as a general matter, you want to limit your fact section to legally relevant facts, and how do you know if they're legally relevant? Well, if they weren't part of your legal analysis, there's a chance they're not legally relevant. Or there's a chance that your legal analysis is insufficient. Okay, so just a bullet point for the legally relevant facts, and then a discussion section. And for your outline, Alex, and for everyone, here's what I would, well, here's what I expect for your discussion section. I'd like to see your opening paragraph. And then, Zach, remind us, how many parts are there to the Brady test? This was part of your homework for to last week, so if you don't remember it, off the top of your head, it's okay, but Brady test has how many parts? Is it two? Close. Three? Three parts. Three parts to the Brady test. Believe me, by the end of the semester, once you've done an outline and a rough draft and a final draft of a memo about the Brady test, you're gonna be dreaming about the Brady test, okay? So it has three parts to the Brady test. So for each part, here's what I think your outline should have. It should have at least a sentence of rule explanation with a cite. And then at least a sentence of rule application that connects facts from our case to that, to that legal rule. And the third, bless you, the third part of the Brady test is the materiality inquiry. Was the evidence in question material to the, tri to the trial? Would it have, is there a reasonable probability it would have affected the outcome of the trial? So that may take that's maybe two sentences of explanation in your outline, and it may take you know one or two sentences more of rule application, because it's a more complex inquiry. Question one, was the evidence withheld from the defense? I'll tell you right now, it's gonna be a pretty basic inquiry for our first question. Okay. So in your final memo, you would do a conclusion section. I don't think you need a conclusion section for your outline. Yeah, so I'm a little confused just by looking at this at face value. Um, so in the discussion outline, do you want us to have a rule explanation, rule application, and a citation for each part of the? Yep. Okay, okay. So remember, in your memo that you turned in last week, it was a pretty basic rule. What does actual physical control mean in terms of a drunk driver having control of the car? And I said, and it was also a short memo, I said just do one rule explanation and one rule application. Some of you follow that instruction better than others follow that instruction, but that was the instruction. This time I'm saying do three mini CREACs. And so in that way it's more similar to the IRAC highlighting exercise that we did in class the day before your memo was due, the class before your memo was due. That used mini CREAC, mini CREAC, mini CREAC. <coughs> so you're gonna have, in your final memo, subsection one of your discussion section, it's gonna have CREAC, conclusion, rule explanation, rule application, conclusion, for the first part of the Brady test. <coughs> and then the same thing for the second part of the Brady test, and the third, same thing for the third part of the Brady test. Now, for your memo, you want to include cases that are most analogous to your, yeah. Uh, what are the two QP and essays in Georgia? Question presented in Georgia. So, for your, um, for your memo, you will want to find analogous cases to our fact pattern. Brady cases that are not 100% on point because Brady inquiries are so fact dependent, it's gonna be very difficult to find the exact same case. But 
Look for cases that are analogous, then engage in the kind of analogical reasoning that you did for your first memo. Some people did some really good job, really good job in the first memo of comparing the Richfield City v. Walker case to our fact pattern. How many cases should you find? Well, as usual, it will depend in part on how good your best cases are. So at least find a case where you can say, here's a case that's just like ours, and the defendant wins. Not just like ours, but here's a case that's as close to ours as I can find. But the more cases like that you can find, the better. And then you also want to find cases where the defendant loses, and our facts are distinguishable from those facts. <clears throat> Now, if we had a losing case, and you were writing an objective memo about why we have a losing case, you would find cases where the defendant in those previous cases had lost, and you would have to say, and here's why that case is like our case. Our case is, a, is likely a winning case. Uh, and then I'll give you a hint for your research, and this should inform uh, how you prepare for the meeting coming up. So I based this case on a real case from the U.S. Court of Appeals from the D.C. Circuit. I tried to throw in a lot of bells and whistles to our case so that it wasn't, so it won't be especially easy for you to find the most analogous case. So for example, our case involves a gun and a car. And I'll just tell you right now, the analogous case, the most highly analogous case, does not involve a gun or a car. So don't think, oh, well, I didn't find a case with a gun or a car, therefore I'm failing. But think about what what is the legal analysis pivoting on, hinging on in our case? Try to find a case, as many cases like that as you can, there's one in particular uh, that um, I think guides the outcome of this case. Your outline will affect, can affect your participation grade, as does all the work you turn in, uh, aside from your final memos, to get their own grade. Um, and I'll tell you in the simulation if you're way off. So even though it's a simulation, we'll break character at the end. And I'll say, like, okay, you're on the right track. Um, or here's how, here's, let's talk about how you might be able to course correct. I'll ask you some questions about the kind of research you've done or walk through. Okay. So you're going to read about outlining. But my last thought for today on outlining is not really my thought, it's Justice Breyer's thought. So let's take a, list, let's take a look at what he has to say. 